and a lot of you know Lake. He's very well known in our industry. It's always a treat to have him come on, and uh, we're looking forward to today's presentation. So, hey, Lake, how's it going today? I'm good. However, I, I, I got to look here, right, and then wave over there. I got to move my box around so I don't look like a total idiot. There we go. That's probably a little bit better. <laughs> Hope everybody can see the web the webcam. Figure it might be a look, little better. You know. Looks good. That you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, hello from my basement here in North Carolina. You know. So I guess we should go ahead and get started then, right? You know, that's the the problem with everything these days is that everything's just so relaxed. But like I was telling Rob and Amanda earlier, you know, for the whole world being shut down, I feel busier than ever. Just the number of phone calls and emails, you know, every day is tremendous. And you know, and like the guys at AERA who are still working. Uh, fortunately, Total Seal, we're still working too. Uh, out in, the shop out in Arizona is you know, deemed an essential business, fortunately, and so they're still working away. Phones are busy right now. I can look over and see that Kevin's on the phone with somebody right now. So it's pretty great. You know, it's uh, we're very fortunate um, to be able to continue to operate and continue to work and get things done. And we're hearing great feedback from uh, you know machinists and engine shops like yourselves that are watching today you know, that they're still got engines coming in and still work to be done. So that's a great thing. And really, really excited that, uh, you know, NASCAR is getting back to uh, racing at Darlington this month. And one, if you know any but my dad, uh, Darlington's a place that's near and dear to our hearts. I happened to be at Darlington in 1988 uh, when uh, dad won the the Trans South 500 uh, there and is number 83 wins Kmart Oldsmobile. That was awesome. Um, so a little bit of throwback there. So great, great to be having the season kicking back off. And I hope that's going to be able to help kind of turn the tide and many other people kind of say, hey, we're, we can go racing and uh, things going to get closer back to normal again. So it's a good thing. So I, I guess with that, Rob, I should probably get in the presentation, right? <laughs> Sounds good whenever you're ready. <laughs> All right, so killed enough time. Let's get going. Um, as Rob said, all right, I'm gonna move on here. I am Lake Speed Jr. And again, several of you guys know me from being around uh, the industry for a long time. Of course, because my, my dad, um, that's him in the blue helmet back there behind me. Uh, of course, he's not there behind me very long. Yeah, dad, so super fast. And we're actually really hoping, you know, that's us doing the vintage go kart racing stuff, and really, really hoping to get up to Newcastle, Indiana uh, in June for the uh, Vintage Nationals up there at uh, Mark Dismore's track and get those go-karts go back out there and smell some two-stroke uh, oil and methanol. Actually, the best thing we'd run is we own castor bean oil. So the, you know, the smell of castor bean oil and methanol is just like the best smell in the whole world to me. Just, you know, it's great. So hope we get to go be doing that. And, you know, that's obviously my background is uh, for those who don't know me, uh, you know, my dad was an NASCAR driver, grown up around racing my whole life. I uh, was the head uh, formulator at uh, Joe Gibbs Driven, you know, did all the testing and development on the, the motor oils, you know, and, and gear oils and everything else on, on the Gibbs program. Uh, very fortunate that, you know, the products that I helped design and test, you know, won many, many uh, championships and many many races around the world and various series beyond NASCAR and so I kind of look at engines from a different perspective you know you know there's guys you know next week things are going to be fantastic by the way just a little plug the super webinar you know next Friday make time for it it's going to be worth it I mean it's you know, one, if you've ever heard Billy Godbold speak, you know you will learn something. Ben Strader, you're going to learn something. My b buddy Keith Jones, uh, who I get to work with now, is just, uh, he's the ring whisperer. I mean, the guy just knows so much, you know, and he's so sharp with, with those things that it's, and I'm just going to talk about oil for a little bit. It'd be kind of fun. But it, it's it's going to be fantastic. So mark your calendars register today, do it, it's going to be worth it. Um, so with that kind of plug out of the way, for that, you know, really when I look at an engine, I do, I look at it from the eyes of a tribologist, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and then, you know, 
my section uh, of the presentation next Friday is going to be more of a deep dive into tribology and, and why you should care about tribology and how that influences your engine and maybe it's a little bit of an expansion of what we're going to talk about today and kind of looking at an engine from the eyes of a tribologist and what that means. So um, with that being said, we'll, we'll move forward a little bit. In case you are wondering how my dad is doing, dad's doing great. I'm actually going over to the shop tomorrow. We're going to be dynoing an engine. Uh, we got these little, you know, air-cooled two-stroke engines. We got a air cool or a water-cooled four-cycle. It's like a 12,000 RPM, 250cc engine that we're going to be uh, kind of getting going that I plan on doing a lot of ring testing with so that we have some data so we can go in and maybe try different things like different uh, back, you know, back clearance or side clearance and be able to, to document those results. That way we can share uh, with you guys what we see. And it's not that we're sharing somebody else's information that's proprietary. You know, we can give you real information on a single cylinder engine where we don't have anything else going on. You know, there's no cross talk in the manifold or anything like that. It's pretty straightforward. We can go there and do things like that and then say, hey, here's what we see. And then it's data you can use to make you hopefully improve the efficiency of your program, which is what we're all about. So, yep, dad's doing really good. Just by what, by you know, the guy in the red suit over there isn't actually me. That's my son, Benjamin. Uh, dad giving him some lessons this past summer. And yeah, you know, hopefully this summer we get to go out the racetrack and continue that education for, for Ben. You know, dad's still so super fast. It's crazy, you know. So to the meat of the presentation, what were we talking about? Tribology. I've kind of thrown that word out a couple of times. Tribology is the fancy word for the study of friction, wear, and lubrication. I'm a member of a group called the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers, and within that, I'm one of less than a uh, thousand people in the whole world that's a certified lubrication specialist and oil monitoring analyst, and then you get into all the other stuff I've done and it makes me pretty, I'm, I'm an oil nerd at heart, I really am. But I love engines. My passion is engines. And, you know, that's really why working at Total Seal is so great is that, you know, I'm not tied to any one, you know, brand of lubricant anymore. And that's a, that's a nice thing. And all of that information does apply. And when we get to talking about ring seal, which is going to be the real heart and the meat uh, of the presentation today, you'll kind of see that, you know, ring seal is part of that. You know, ring seal is the essence. It's the real key to the efficiency of the engine. And oil is part of that process, and we're going to talk more about that, you know, later in the presentation. So the, you know, tribology is that study of friction, wear, and lubrication. So the lubrication is part of it, but there's more to tribology than just oil. It's also about wear and friction, and that's really where, you know, getting to work for Total Seal is fantastic because piston rings happen to be a severe or major contributor to all of those things, you know, they, they have a definite influence on friction, they have a definite influence on wear, and because of, you know, an oil control ring, it has, plays a role in terms of lubrication in regards to the cylinder wall and how a piston ring seals up. So with that, let's get moving forward and kind of go over what we're talking about in terms of efficiency. So when we're talking about efficiency, we got to kind of begin with a fundamental understanding of the engine from a, we'll call it from a chemical perspective. Because again, I'm a tribologist, I'm a chemical guy, but I love engines and I look at engines as a chemical reactor. You know, an internal combustion engine reacts air in fuel to create heat energy. That heat energy, you know, that expansion is what moves the piston. That's what creates the, the force that makes power, okay? So we're taking that heat energy, we're converting it to useful work. From that perspective, the energy potential of an internal combustion engine is basically limited by the amount of air and fuel the engine can process. Okay, you know, the old school way we talked about things, right? There's no replacement for displacement. You know, the, the bigger the displacement of the engine, the more air and fuel it can process. Of course, you look at a, a, a small F1 engine, you're like, well, I mean, they make tons of power, but it's very small displacement, but they're processing the fuel more rapidly. 
when Ben talks next week, he's going to have some great information, which is why, again, back to sign up for the super webinar because, you know, part of this thing is okay, how much air, how much fuel can you process in a given amount of time becomes the energy potential of the engine. And that's really a great way of looking at it because it's not about how big the engine is necessarily, right? It's how much energy potential can I process, right? The more air and fuel I can process in a given amount of time, the more energy potential lies in the engine. So if we take that as the, the beginning point, now we say, okay, there is a set energy potential for an engine. How much of that energy potential is actually moving the vehicle? How much of that actually leaves the engine? Um, this slide here you know, from our buddies at Chevron Phillips shared it with me, actually comes from a Department of Energy study back in 2008. Just last year, Ford Motor Company released a study that has basically almost identical results. So, you know, 12 years, you know, 11 years later, Ford releases a study where its findings are pretty much mirror what the 2008 study did. And both of them point to one key thing. If you begin with the energy potential of the engine, 35% of, of that potential blows straight out the exhaust, which is why turbochargers are so popular now at the OE level, because it is the lowest hanging fruit in terms of improving the efficiency of an engine. You're taking that heat energy and you're returning it back into useful work that would have just blown out the exhaust and gone to nowhere. 30% of that energy potential is you know, gone through the cooling system. I won't call it wasted, but it's not moving, it's not being used to move the piston. It's just you know, wasted out through the cooling system. That leaves 35% of the energy potential actually moving the piston. Of that 35%, only 23% actually makes it to the flywheel, leaves the engine. So there's you know 12% of that energy potential is lost within the engine. Now, half of that is just an air pumping. It's a four cycle engine. There's just wasted energy because of being a four cycle. That's just pretty much a fixed deal, right? Half of that though, that other 6% is pretty much engine friction. And 45% of that friction is the piston ring and cylinder wall interface. Right, 46% if you follow the math right here. So if you look at it, you know, of that energy that is moving the piston, the frictional losses, almost half of the frictional losses in the engine come down to the piston wall or piston or the piston ring to cylinder wall interface. So as a tribologist, guess what is the lowest hanging fruit? in order to reduce friction and improve efficiency. Piston ring, <laughs> right? So that's why I'm so excited to be working at Total Seals because, you know, as an oil guy, you're like, okay, well, I have some part of that, but the biggest chunk is the piston ring. So if I can improve how the piston ring is interacting with the cylinder wall and the piston itself to improve ring seal, reduce friction, now I can really take a sledgehammer, not just a you know ball peen hammer to this problem and really unlock a lot of potential and increase the efficiency and durability of the engine. So that's really where the lowest hanging fruit outside of a turbocharger in terms of efficiency is the piston ring. So the tools we can use to do this we're going to be one trying to reduce friction, right? And we're going to get into what that means and how piston rings can reduce friction. But then the other part of it is going to be ring seal. Back to that single cylinder engine, we're going to be dynoing tomorrow. That's one great thing about a single cylinder engine. There's nowhere to hide. 
you know, when I was doing the development work uh, on oil formulas at, at Gibbs, we had a single cylinder engine you know, for the motocross team, right? We had a dyno for the motocross team. I had a single cylinder engine and that's where everything would begin in terms of oil testing. And you could sit there and we had a little lab and we could sit there and blend up an oil, run downstairs and pour it in the motor <laughs> and run the engine and see what it did and run back upstairs and change the formula and run back down. And it was great to be able to do that. So, but that single cylinder engine is fantastic tuning tool. In fact, most uh, Formula One engine uh, development is all done on a single cylinder engine. Because you know a V8 is essentially is eight single cylinder engines, and if it's a common blend manifold, that's what ties it together. You know, if you look at an individual runner engine, there's not as much crosstalk on that. You know, because there's, there's there's not. You know, they're all eight individual cylinder engines with individual runners. Um, you know, so those are the kind of things we look at is trying to say, okay, when you look at an engine and you're trying to improve the efficiency of that engine in terms of ring seal is a big part of that because everything that blows by that, that piston ring is wasted energy. So you want to have the best ring seal and you want to have the least amount of friction. And it, it goes back to, you know, what we learned at Gibbs with uh, restrictor plate motors. Yeah, I've said for years and years and years, you know, when they put that plate on those engines back in 1987, I believe it was, uh, end of 86, that's when the cup engine programs took off. You know, that's where we learned so much on a plate engine. Uh, that's where aerodynamics really became big, you know, is that we, Daytona Talladega, that was what it was all about. You know, I got a picture over my wall right over there of the number 92 car from Talladega, one of the pole in 2001. That's pride, you know, the camshaft on my desk that you can't see is right over there, Daytona motor um, that Mark Cronquist gave me, you know, from when Daytona one year. It's, I love plate racing, not because I think plate racing is great, it's because that was the challenge where the, it wasn't the driver, right? It was the engine in the car. It was everything, it, the faster that car was, the better it could be and it wasn't about handling and all that and i know there's shot guys and all that and let the shot guys and the chassis guys do their thing i you know i'm wide open throttle fast as we can make as much power as we can and the plate program is really where we found things and you know while i may be new at total seal my relationship with total seal is not new it goes back to when i first came to gibbs and we were running you know, 0.8 millimeter rings back in 2004. You know, today we're running 0.5 millimeter rings. You know, 0.8 in the thousand horsepower desert off-road truck engine. You know, so my experience in history goes way back with Total Seal because of our relationship uh, with Joe Gibbs Racing and the fact that every Joe Gibbs Racing engine built since 2002 has had total seal piston rings in it and not a single one of those were a gapless ring so when we're talking about total seal please don't you know confuse that total seal and gapless equals the same thing you know the majority of the piston rings we manufacture are not gapless now, in fact myself personally i've never used a, a gapless ring i mean I've, i know you know like ron shaver and and don i think don you're watching hey buddy um you know, they use gapless uh, rings, second rings in their the methanol, you know, uh, injected alcohol engines because for uh, dilution contamination control, you know, uh, and that's, we can talk about that later in, in the seminar, but, you know, that's really, you know, my experience, my background with Total Seal is my relationship at Joe Gibbs Racing. And then the time, you know, we spent doing oil testing at Shavers, you know, we were using 0.7 millimeter rings in that engine so i kind of jumped ahead of myself there we'll, we'll get to that in a minute you know but really those are the tools that we're trying to you know deploy here in order to increase efficiency is we want to reduce friction and we want to improve ring seal and if we can do those two things we're going to improve the efficiency of the engine and the tool to how we kind of look at that and this is really what i'm going to talk about next week so 
uh, if you anybody happen to be that's on here, if you happen to be on the webinar recently, uh, Andy from line to line talked a little bit about the stride back curve and how you know the piston skirt coating you know was a a, a way of influencing and shifting the stride back curve. So my section of the super webinar, yep, here's the third time, right? Going back a third time, why you should sign up for the super webinar. What I'm going to do is a deep dive next week on the stride back curve. It's all going to be about tribology, and we're going to look at the stride back curve and really get into the details and show how those changes in surface finish, um, speed, load, viscosity, how all all those things factor in to changing the the shape of the stride back curve because the flatter that curve is the more efficient your engine is going to be but that's sink in there for a minute you, you see that curve on the screen you see how to the left of it it's really high up and then it flattens down and then it starts to go back up again the flatter that curve is the more efficient your engine is going to be so what we're going to talk about next week is the tools to flatten that out. You know, we know that in that boundary condition, friction is going to be very high. And in that boundary condition, that's where you have the highest level of load, the lowest speed. And then on the other side, you see the friction coming back up as it rises to that hydrodynamic region. You see that friction begins to increase the further you go to the right. And that's where the oil films get thicker and thicker and thicker, the higher and higher speed you go. You know, one interesting thing about a piston ring, because we're going to go into the details of all that again next week, and I won't waste the time now uh, getting into that. The thing to know is a piston ring is the only device in the engine, the only part in the engine that actually experiences all three stages of lubrication on every engine cycle. You know, a camshaft's going to, you know, be in the boundary condition the majority of the time. You know, every, every degree of lift is going to be in boundary condition. It's going to be in the mixed condition on the base circle. Your engine bearings are always going to be running in hydrodynamic except the startup. You know, but the piston rings are going to start off, you know, think about a piston. Uh, let's, we'll, we'll start at mid-stroke. Mid-stroke approaching top dead center on a compression stroke. At mid-stroke, that's the highest piston velocity. I think if I remember the math in my head, it's like over 1,500 feet per second. It's like stupid fast, right? Um, there's an article in Engine Professional Magazine where I did all the math, and, I, and it's coming out, I think, the third quarter issue, where we calculated all the speeds and listed this out so you can kind of get an understanding of it. But, you know, that highest, that mid-stroke, that's your highest surface speed of the piston ring and the piston itself in that condition that piston ring it's a ski right it's operating in hydrodynamic full film condition but as the piston approaches top dead center two things begin to happen one it starts to slow down but also as it approaches top dead center cylinder pressure is building the stride back curve is viscosity times speed divided by load. So in the operating environment, operating temperature of the engine, the viscosity is not going to change. It's, the, it's a fixed value at that point. Now, obviously, engine gets hotter or gets colder. You know, that can change, and you can change that by changing the oil. But you know, in the engine for a given moment of time, a given a, a cycle, viscosity is going to be the same. What's going to change is your speed and the load. And as you decrease speed of the piston as it nears top dead center and you increase cylinder pressure, that's increasing the load because that cylinder pressure is getting behind the ring and forcing the ring out and increasing the load of the, of the ring against the cylinder wall. For those two reasons, you're going to move from that full film into that mixed film. Then you're going to move into boundary condition. But you think about it when you look at a the bore of an engine that's been run, where's all the wear? Well, it's pretty much in your top dead center and your bottom dead center, because those are the areas, the lowest speed and the highest load. Obviously, there's more high load 
at top dead center than bottom dead center, which is why there's more wear at the top of the bore than the bottom of the bore. So you know that's the that's the perspective to kind of look at, you know, uh, how the ring is interacting and tribolo that tribology focus and perspective on the engine. So what are we going to do about it? Okay, the best way to reduce friction is to reduce surface area. You think about it. You go out to Bonneville, all those streamliners, they're streamlined and they're small. Why? They're not like Mack trucks. It's surface area. The smaller the surface area, right, the least amount of drag. You know, anybody that's gone skiing, you know, knows that, you know, that the fast downhill skiers ski on thin skis, not big giant snowboards, right? So when you go from, say, an 043 ring to, uh, say, a 0.9 millimeter ring to, say, a 0.7 millimeter ring, which is what we did at Driven with our little test engine we had there at Shaver Specialties. You know, they, they built that motor and allowed us to use that engine. Uh, we call it Oscar. It's been running forever. And we started off initially with Oscar with 043 rings. And we would do all the testing and, you know, I'm going to show some slides later and I'm sure Billy will talk about it some maybe next week that, you know, to do oil testing, we wanted to make sure we were um, doing the right kind of wear measurements. So a flat tap at cam engine is a great engine to measure wear with because you can take an ad coal and you can measure the cam lobe, all 16 lobes. We were able to do with that engine is take, you know, have Billy and those guys do cams for us, measure all 16 lobes, put it in the engine, break in the engine, run it for 30 minutes, now get everything broken in good, pull the cam back out, ship it back to comp, have them measure all 16 lobes again. And then we had a baseline to begin with. We already knew it was already broken in. Then we could run a two to three hour race simulation on that cam, then send it back and have it remeasured. And then we could do that, you know, we could do two of those a day out there at Shavers. You know, once the cams are broken in, we could show up, boom, 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 break in, you know, run these back-to-back -back durability tests, and then send the cams back and have them checked. Well, one thing we found when we started off doing that with the 043 rings is that, you know, you run that test day after day after day. Well, you, know, you come back as the engine would run, you'd see a change in power over time as you, you just, you know, think about it. If you do, you know, two, three hour race simulations a day, well, that's six hours of engine runtime a day. You do that for five days, that's 30 hours of runtime. You know, there's uh, 30 some pulls. I mean, you'd be oh, well over 300 dyno pulls in a week. And you're trying to look at the differences between not only the wear differences between different oils, you're doing oil analysis on that, but you're also trying to look at the power levels. And you're seeing the power levels drop off over time. You're like, well, are those oil formulations not as good? Or is it something about the engine giving up? So as we went forward in time, you know, and we're working on different things, we went from 043 rings to the 0.9 millimeter rings. And that made a big difference in you know, going from an 043 ductile molly face ring to the AP steel ring, that was a huge change in the consistency of the engine. Going to the 0.9 millimeter consistency was just way better. It was also about eight, 10 horsepower better, you know, um, horsepower wise. And we're like, wow, that's kind of cool. It just got better. And then the key thing is that it stayed better. Then the best thing we ever did, we were working on some braking oil formulations and I called up Keith and I said, Keith, what would be the hardest ring combination to break in in a wet sump motor? And he's like, ah, I can send you a tie nitride coated, uh, you know, face coating 0.7 millimeter ring. If you can get that thing to break in, you know, you, you're really doing something. Yeah, that's gonna be pretty tricky to break in, you know, a 0.7 millimeter, you know, tie nitride, you know, real hard face coating uh, ring. I said, all right, cool, send it to us, we'll give it a go. So we actually, you know, put it in, ran it and got her to break in 
you know, and it was like, awesome, this is great. Once that thing bedded in, and there's a story on that later, that became like the Swiss watch engine. It didn't vary. No matter how many runs, it could be the 300th pull or the 30th pull or the 330th pull. If you had the same oil in there at the same temperature, you know, water temperature, you got the same number. You would just Swiss watch consistent. Now, the key thing with that was, you know, when we went from the 0.9 to the 0.7, it gained another 10 plus horsepower. So we saw a 3% increase in efficiency just by changing piston rings. That was pretty incredible. You know, also, you think back again, the NASCAR stuff. You went back in the old days, you know, 043 was thin. Today, 0.5 millimeter in those short blocks live forever. So one of the things you can do, you know, reducing friction, if you can go to the smaller, thinner ring, you can you you can do it, and it will increase horsepower. Period. You look at the days, you know, the the new LT engines from Chevrolet that are going in the the Camaros and the Corvettes, 0.8 millimeter rings from the factory. Think about that. You know, in the old days, you know. 16th ring is you know, roughly about a two millimeter ring, you know, rounding there. Um, you know, you go from two millimeter rings in the old days to one and a half, you know, down to one is pretty common. You know, if you get uh, pistons from Mala or pretty much anybody anymore, there's, you know, either one or one, two is pretty common uh, on a shell piston these days. Now the OEMs are as thin as 0.8 millimeters. You know, so why friction reduction? You know, you're going to smaller rings to reduce friction on the OEM level, they're doing it for fuel economy. It's a way to gain power and performance improvement. But I will also say this too. One of the things we noticed in that same engine is it increased durability. And one of the best comparisons we did was, you know, when we were developing the GP1 oil, one of the things we saw with the GP1 engine oil was, okay, we're going to do this oil and we're going to need it to do the flat tappet test. We ran the flat tappet test at Shavers. But when you're developing oil, it's not just going to run in a flat tappet motor. You got to test it in a roller cam motor to see. So you think about it, that roller cam engine back to the stride back curve, the flat tap is going to be in that boundary condition. Roller cam is not going to be in that same boundary condition. Reason why is because of that roller wheel moving. And just like a wheel on a tire, right? What does it do? It deforms, flattens it out. You think about hydroplaning, right? You get, if there's water between the tire and the road, it's actually going to, that deformation is going to, hydroplane is going to lift. That's why we have, you know, um, groove tires for the wet. We don't have groove lifters, you know, not lifter wheels, right? Um, and what happens with that oil is going to be between the wheel and the cam lobe. Now, there's surface roughness there, but that oil is going to be trapped in there, and it's going to actually basically maintain that mixed film condition. So to account for that, we had to run the same oil in the flat tappet engine and also in a roller cam engine. So we actually bought a, a LS engine, one of the a CT525 engines, and we ran the same oils in both the flat tappet motor and the roller cam LS motor, ran the same durability cycles, and then took oil analysis samples from both engines. Because obviously the flat tappet is very easy to measure the wear, like I said before, with the ad coal, but it's a lot more challenging to do that with a roller cam engine. So the way to, to determine where in the roller cam engine was to do used oil analysis. So what was interesting is when you looked at the used oil analysis results, the flat tappet engine had less wear metal, had less iron in the oil. Well, that makes no, no sense. That's completely counterintuitive. You would think that the flat tappet motor operating in boundary conditions and all that would have generated more wear than a roller cam engine. Ah, here's the difference. 
the roller cam engine had one millimeter, one mil, or 1.2, 1.2, three millimeter oil ring package in it versus the flat tappet motor having a 0.7 millimeter, 0.7 millimeter diamond finished, you know, ring package. The difference, same amount of dyno, 350 dyno pulls, same oils, one's two parts per million, one's four parts per million, and then you look at the leak down, and that's where the proof was in the pudding. The 0.7 millimeter ring engine only leaked 6.75%, whereas the uh, roller cam motor was 10.25. The increase in wear was due to an increase in bore wear. It wasn't the valve train that was causing the higher levels of iron. It was the cylinder bore wear because a larger ring is a bigger file. That's simple, right? Even if the surface finishes were the same on both rings, which they probably weren't because one was a diamond finish ring, but if you had a larger ring of the same roughness, it's a bigger file, it's going to root more material. And then when you go to, you know, a diamond finish ring with a smoother surface finish, it's like going to a higher grit sandpaper, right? It's just smoother. It's going to wear less. So those are the things to think about that you can change friction and you can increase durability. Going to a thinner ring doesn't mean engine durability is compromised. In fact, we've seen the exact opposite. When you go to a thinner ring made out of steel, versus cast iron, that material difference is huge. And that steel ring is going to have PVD applied base coatings, which are going to increase the durability because those are basically essentially that coating, a dry film lubricant. So you're putting the oil where it's supposed to be, a, a, or sorry, not the oil, but you're putting a lubricant where it's supposed to be when it needs supposed to be. So it can protect that surface and provide increased durability so you can increase horsepower and increase durability, longevity, without any compromises by improving the material selection of the ring, the coating of the ring, and then optimizing the size of the ring as a way to unlock the efficiency of the engine by doing that. And really what that comes down to is, you know, I look at that ring seal is like a soup. And that's one thing we saw with that motor is that you're trying to increase efficiency. Well, the soup, you know, isn't just the broth. It's not just, you know, the meat. It's not just the vegetables or the spices. All of that has to come together to create the soup. Ring seal is the same thing. It's not just the piston. It's not just the cylinder wall finish. It's not just the ring. It's not just the oil. You know, when you think about oil as part of this, soup, you got to think about it like a gasket, all right? If you've got a cylinder head and you've got a block, you wouldn't just bolt them together without a gasket and expect it not to leak. It's the gasket is there to fill in the valleys between the cylinder head and the block, those surface irregularities. That's what the oil does. The oil is the gasket between the piston between the ring, between the cylinder wall. Because those are all metal objects. They're all going to have surface finish. What's taking up that gap, filling that void, is the oil. That's why the oil is part of that process. It's part of that ring seal soup. You know, other part of that ring seal soup is, you know, ring seal itself. What? How does the ring seal? Because that's all piston ring is. It's a seal, right? Leak paths are three. There's three main leak paths. The first one is the end gap, right? That's what Joe Moriarty started Total Seal doing, right? Was we're going to address the leak path number one by creating a gapless ring. That way we seal that gap by having the overlapping ring. That was the whole idea of the gapless ring. But that's not the only leak path, right? Leak path number two is actually around the ring groove. And that's where the diamond finishing ring came in. That's where when Total Seal got into NASCAR at, at Gibbs, that was what the selling point was, was the diamond finish ring. You get that ring groove as flat and smooth as you can, then you need to have a flat, smooth ring to seal up properly. You know, when you look at the diamond finish ring and how smooth it is, you know, you look at a cast ring, the RA is around like four, 
you know, you go to, which isn't bad, right? But you go a diamond finish ring, it is 0.4. So it's a fraction of the surface fin, of the surface roughness. Smoother, flatter, better ring seal matches up. And the last thing is your leak path is past the face. You know, a uh, little history. So a guy named John Ramsbottom, an Englishman, in 1852 invented the piston ring for a steam engine, right before the internal combustion engine was even developed, right? So the idea of the piston ring has been around for a long time. And that leak path, you know, past the face, we, you're trying to, to deal with that. And in the old days, when the engines had low compression, you could have really high ring tension, and that would basically do the job. But in today's higher compression engines, it's not the ring tension that's creating the seal. It's the gas pressure getting behind it and forcing it out. You know, if you're thinking about 1,500 PSI of cylinder pressure, 20 pounds of ring tension is not going to seal that. You've got to get the, the gas behind the ring, utilize that gas to push out to seal against the, the, the piston wall or a cylinder wall, right? That's the only way that ring can seal that groove to the cylinder wall is by having the gas pressure behind it. And of course, that's where gas porting has been around. You know, that's the whole idea of gas porting. Been around since at least the 70s, you know, and started off as vertical gas ports. And of course, the problem with vertical gas ports, you know, is that, you know, gasoline, they, they get dirty. You know, gasoline is a blend of molecules. So, you know, there's a distillation curve with gasoline because it's a blend. There's small hydrocarbons and there's large hydrocarbons. And what you typically see the carbon buildup that you see in a gasoline engine is the larger molecules that have not been burned. You know, um, again, that distillation curve, if it doesn't vaporize, it can't burn. That's why diesel engines create so much soot is that the heavier hydrocarbons in diesel, because there's such a small window um, for it to, you know, of injection for it to vaporize, it doesn't vaporize, it's still liquid under the heat, it carbonizes, that's what creates it. That's why direct injection engines make soot. Anybody that watched the webinars we did about direct injection, you'll know that, right? It's that amount of time, you gotta vaporize the fuel for it to be able to burn. If it doesn't burn, it just becomes carbon. So that's why gas ports would block up, which is why methanol, a single molecule, runs so much cleaner. Not because it's a better solvent, that's part of it, but the main reason why single molecule versus blend, single distillation temperature versus a boiling range. That's why it runs cleaner. But when you go to a lateral gas port, that was kind of the solution for, you know, not having vertical gas ports. Lateral gas ports, again, been around for a long time, work really great, it's ring jujitsu, right? You're using that gas pressure, getting it behind the ring to force it out. So now I can lower the static tension of the ring, reducing friction, remember, Bell, the calculation on the stride bed curve, that friction is a you know, calculation of viscosity times speed divided by load. Take away, take away uh, ring tension, I drop some of that load, I reduce my friction. The downside of lateral gas ports are you're going to end up, well, one thing, you're putting a hole in the side of the piston, right? So you're taking that top ring land and you're putting a hole in it. Inevitably, to have equal distribution of the gas pressure, you have to have a gas port near the exhaust valve relief, which means you've made the weakest part of the piston even weaker by putting a hole in it. Well, the solution to that is a gas ported piston ring. And we've been doing these for several years now at Total Seal with the highest end teams. Uh, and it, actually, it's just the next evolution, right? You're using that same concept of gas pressure, that ring jujitsu, using the gas pressure to help you as opposed to trying to fighting against it. But now, as opposed to having to put the hole in the piston, you're putting it in the ring instead, which isn't a problem because this ring is made out of either you know tool steel or stainless steel, right? 
You can even do it in, in the larger cast rings if you needed to, they're, they're ductile. But really it's about putting it you know, in the steel rings. And the, the advantage of that is twofold. One, now you're not putting a hole in the piston. Number two is the piston ring is actually in contact with the cylinder wall and it is rotating. And that's the real key difference. Because that ring is rotating, now the gas pressure is actually being put and spread all the way around the cylinder bore as opposed to always lo loading one area. You know, it's pretty common they said, that, okay, well, you, you can't run a gas ported, you know, piston, you know, in a street engine because you know, it's gonna wear the bore out. Well, the reason it wears the bore out isn't because it's gas ported, it's because it's pushing on the same spot on the bore over and over and over again. Anybody that's ever honed an engine that's got gas ported pistons, you'll know first stroke down, you can see the witness marks of where the gas ports are because it's only loading the same area. With a gas ported ring, it doesn't do that. It's moving it around so it's more even bore wear. Back to being a tribologist and oil guy, other thing I tell you is the detergents in the motor oil that keep things clean are more effective on steel than they are on aluminum. In fact, they're not effective on aluminum. So one thing is the motor oil detergents can actually keep the gas ports in a ring clean where they can't in a piston. So that's another advantage right there is that, you know, by having the gas ported ring, you can utilize that chemistry advantage and mechanical advantage to get all the benefits of gas porting without the downsides of what we've seen in the past traditionally. It's a way of overcoming that. The next thing in terms of ring seal is going to be about, you know, the total conform ring. You know, this is a design we developed for larger bore engines and aluminum block engines. Uh, in some testing we did recently uh, with Joe Gibbs Racing with their desert off-road truck engine, which is an all billet aluminum block big bore engine by going from a 0.8 millimeter diamond finish ring to a 0.8 millimeter diamond finish total conform ring, we cut blow by in half. And the thing is, those radial notches in the back of the ring allow the, the ring to conform locally to the irregularities in the bore. And you think about it, the larger the bore, the more area there is on the bore between the studs, right? That help, you know, provide that strength to the bore. So that larger the span of the bore, the more it can move. Just like, a, you know, if you've got a quarter inch diameter uh, stick and it's three inches long, it's gonna be pretty hard to bend it. If it's 12 inches long, it's a lot easier to bend it for the same wall thickness. You know, so when you look at those big bore engines, that's where there's more distortion total conform ring can keep that seal. It's all going back to, let me get here, leak path number three. You know, the gas ports, total conform are about addressing leak path number three to get it to be, the ring to be able to seal up against a cylinder wall. And then the next thing is you have to have the cylinder wall flat, right? You gotta have the right surface profile, sur surface finish on the ring. I know we're getting close to time, and I'll also say uh, that Keith, uh, in his presentation next week uh, in the Super Webinar, he is going to cover honing uh, in, in great detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit. Yeah, that's the idea is that you need to have the right surface finish on the wall for the ring to seal too. When you do all the things the ring to get it to seal the wall, you have to have that correct surface finish. Back talking about the gasket, it's really that surface roughness here underneath, those valleys are what hold the oil. You know, proper lubrication is the right oil, right place, right time, right amount. You gotta have enough oil in the cylinder bore to be able to be that gasket between the piston groove, the uh, piston ring and the cylinder wall. All that has to be sealing up together. You gotta have the supply and it's the valley that allows that supply to be there. And that's the key thing, you know, from the oil perspective, you know, on that and efficiency perspective, you gotta have that ring seal. Like well, I said, I kind of skipped through this because Keith's gonna touch on it more. You know, another good real world example of that is back to the flat tap at cam. You can see 
pre break in versus post break in right there that change in surface finish but there's still those valleys even on a flat type of cam to provide that retention a place for the oil to be so they can continue to lubricate and help see you know uh protect that cam face you know so really break-in procedure is the last thing i want to touch on before we run out of time I'm not sure if we can go how far we can go over rob and amanda but i don't have anywhere else to go if no one else does um <laughs> but really when it comes to break-in procedure you know if you have a dyno obviously what you want to do is get load on the engine cylinder pressure is what you have to have in order to get the rings to mate to the cylinder wall if you don't have a dyno you need to drive the car you know, get it up the temperature get everything heated up moving around expanded properly then drive it like you stole it that's so important people that baby engines you know you can't idle an engine and get it to break in it's not going to work you got to have cylinder pressure number two is you need to change the oil in that first couple hundred miles you know it's really really important there's 10 times more wear during break-in than there is at any other time the engine's life so you want to get that debris out of the engine so it doesn't cause abrasive wear throughout the engine and damage surfaces and then number two or third thing is you want to use a low tb in oil yeah we did a webinar uh back in january that talked specifically about that uh that really gets into the details and i can kind of hit the highlights when one should you use a synthetic oil for break-in the simple answer is no not because it's synthetic necessarily but because typically those oils contain friction modifiers that are going to reduce friction which is not what you want and they typically have a higher tbn because they're designed to live a long time in the engine and high tbn high detergency works against ring seal and we saw that you know from some dedicated testing we did uh, if you look at the, the amount of oil in those exhaust ports the higher the tbn the more oil the longer it is taking in taking the engine to break in right so low tbn accelerates that break-in process speeds it up so it seats in quicker which is going to be a good thing because you know you don't want oil in the combustion chamber because it can cause detonation we've already proven that and that's obviously a big issue with direct injection engines the higher the combustion pressures you know the higher the uh, compression ratio in the engine the more tendency there is for knock and detonation and oil in that environment lowers the octane value of your air fuel mixture increases knock tendency so you don't want that so you want that lower tbn oil especially in high compression engines and we also were able to verify that at joe gibbs racing you look at the high tbn oil in the blow by was 21.2 horsepower is 668 swap it over to a low tbn oil and it's 18.9 671. now the trick here in this is we actually ran the low tbn oil first right so all the data we have over all the years points to low tbn oils are better for breaking it speeds everything up it helps things seed in better i saw that myself with a nicosil cylinder you know bore engine which is going to be the most notorious type to break in the engine tomorrow we're going to be running in that 250 single cylinder engine is also nicosil right and i'm going to be using uh driven br30 to break it in because i know that oil is very low tbn high zinc it's excellent for ring seal especially in uh nicosil engines but we're going to do is we're going to get it up the temperature we're going to load the crap out of it we're going to run it hard we're going to change oil. we're going to do all those things and i'm probably planning on doing that on facebook live tomorrow too so hopefully everything works out weather wise and we don't have any complications and around this time tomorrow we're doing that um but you know we've seen this process myself and that engine that if you do the right things with the right oil that follow that procedure you're going to get results that are good uh we had showed this in the previous webinar back in january but it's worth repairing again if you want to know what the tbn value is of different oils there is a report at speeddiagnostics.com uh, forward slash total seal that has detailed analysis of very many different brands like 26 different brands of oil 
that list all the characteristics from the ZDP levels, the TBN values and all that. So all that information is there. So you can make your own decision at Total Seal. We're not recommending any one brand. We're not going to pick a brand. You know, I, I said, well, I'm going to do it for my engine because that's mine, right? And that's my choice. Um, I happen to have a whole lot of confidence in that product because I formulated it. It's mine. I, I believe in it. You know, simple as that. All right, to kind of summarize it, to get to the end. Why does all of this matter? All right, well, one, from an efficiency standpoint, you, you, you go through all the effort, spend the money, you want the engine to be the best that it can be. You know, efficiency is important. But beyond just power, that investment, that durability, you know, you, you can't win the race if you can't finish the race. Motor oil has two enemies, blow by and heat. You know, you think about in a uh, stationary, you know, industrial uh, turbine engine, the oil in that engine uses the same base oil that's in motor oil, same base oil that's in gear oil, transmission fluid. That uh, industrial turbine engine, that will live for 10 years before they change the oil. You can barely go 10,000 miles, you know, in most engines, we got to change the motor oil, but you can go fuel for life. In a transmission. Why? They all have heat, right? They all degrade the oil eventually, so you have to change it eventually. The difference between an internal combustion engine and a turbine engine and a transmission is blow by. The more blow by you get, the shorter the oil life. Period. End of story. So that's why a ring seal is so important. Because if you can get better ring seal, that means you have less blow by which means your oil will live longer and work better. I can tell you one thing that I've seen in working with my daughter, Caroline, that you know can't handle the day-to-day -day operations, the speed diagnostics. When she has a sample that she needs my input on, 99 times out of 100, there's a high level of fuel dilution. It means that the tuning's wrong or there's something that's happened. When you get high levels of contamination in the oil, the oil stops doing its job. That simple, you know? So that's why it's so important to get good ring seal. And there's obviously there's more to it than just the rings themselves. Obviously, if you have a really bad tune-up, it's gonna destroy it, but it, it all works together. The goal is to make the engine as efficient as possible. And to do that, you have to have good ring seal. And if you have good ring seal, and the engine's running efficiently, it's going to live and run for a long time. So with that being said, that's that's the presentation for the day. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Super. Thanks, Lake. That, that's a great presentation. Really good information. Uh, and we do have several questions. So we'll, uh, we'll start here with the first one. Let's have a look here. Uh, this gentleman's asked, when you crosshatch the cylinder wall, uh, is it recommended to do the entire cylinder wall, or can we only do halfway, or only at TDC, or what's your what's your thought on that? Uh, I would do the whole the whole you know because the the entire travel of the ring, you know, in the piston is going to require having um, the so, so uh, the surface finish being correct. Obviously, you know, there's been some. Uh, work done, you know, with like dimpling and things at the very top near TDC to try to, you know, have a different texture uh, in the area that needs it the most versus others, you know, but I'd say, you know, for the most part is that, you know, bang for your buck, time invested, you know, hone it, hone it the entire travel, have the same finish, you know, that way, you you know you've got the right finish for TD for near TDC. Then you know you have a finish that can provide the most protection, uh, the the best you know, sealing performance for the entire length of travel, even if you don't need it. All right, super. Uh, another one for you in Canada it says here we use high concentration of ethanol methanol for octane in our pump gas, 93 rated super premium. Are there any special considerations when running gapless rings in a street performance Gen 3 Hemi stroker build with 11.25 to 1 compression ratio? 
Well, the uh, nice thing is that you know, a gapless ring, because of that higher ethanol content in the fuel, you know, you're gonna, it's going to make the engine's going to run richer, right? It's, it's going to tune it a little bit. And as you run more ethanol in the fuel, you will typically have to run a uh, richer air fuel ratio because the amount of oxygen, you know, that the, the um, fuel brings with it, right? Is It requires that. Um, so because of that, the, the gapless ring is a benefit because when the engine's cold, man, it's really, you know, where one of the big advantages of the gapless ring is when the engine's cold and the clearances are the most, that's where you're going to get more blow by because uh, the, clear, the operating clearances at that point are the widest, you know, and the engine's cold. So your distillation of the fuel is going to be less. So if you think about, you know, the sprint cars and that kind of stuff, you know, they don't really need the gapless when the engine's at wide open throttle, you know. And the engine's at full temperature. You know the operating clearances then are really, really thin, and you got all the the heat working. You know to keep the methanol out. And the methanol's evaporating. It's tuned right. It's when it's idling around and it's cold. That's where the gapless ring, you know, provides the best contamination control um, for everybody. So that's where you know a street build like that, especially in Canada, that's where a gapless ring will be at its best, actually. All right. Next question for you, Lake. Uh, what is the difference in formulation between braking oil and racing oil? Aha! Great question. I love that. Thank you, whoever asked that question. Um, so, I think this is the slide to get to. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, this is the one. So, these uh, two right here, I'm pointing at the screen. You can't see me pointing at the screen. But, okay, so if you, if you can read that chart on the screen, if you look at SDS, 649, that's a sample ID. So that's the third one from the left, and then the fourth one uh, from the left, right? So the SDS 469 versus SDS 470, that's a direct comparison of the GP1 braking oil to the GP1 race oil. Now, just forget about the viscosity part of that because it doesn't really matter at this point because one's a 30, one's a 2050, right? So you can't compare those two. But look at the additive section. Okay, so we're going to walk through that real quick. Okay, so when you look at the calcium, sodium, and magnesium, those are your, that's your detergent package. Again, for break-in, you want a low detergent package. That way, the ZDP can do its job in, in terms of helping to assist that chemical break-in, uh, and you don't want the TBN working against the rings bedding in. So you can see that the calcium level of the GP1 break-in oil is 209, no sodium, no magnesium. But the race oil is 2100. So it's 10 times more. Well, because you know during that initial break-in, everything's clean. You're not gonna run it for super long time. So you don't need a high level of detergent, but once you've broken it in, now you wanna maintain a clean surface. So that balance changes from break-in to raise, the detergent level comes up some to maintain cleanliness. Other thing you're going to see too is your zinc phosphorus levels there, they're really not that different. I mean, a little bit more actually for break in because break in the oil is really kind of like putting down primer before you put down paint. You know, think about, you know, in the old days, you know, growing up around, you know, NASCAR and stuff, yeah, especially in the uh, late 90s when, you know, it was the paint scheme of the week. And that was before we had decal wraps and you actually had to paint cars. There was always work to be done in the body shop. So I, when I worked at Melling, I helped out my buddy, Craig Smith, um, who was the head paint and body guy there at Melling. And we had nine different paint schemes in 1999. And we had to paint all those cars. So we were painting cars a bunch. You know, I'd go back there and help them out, you know, and you put down primer, before you put down base, before you put down clear. You know, if you skip the primer, you can still get the paint down, but it really wouldn't hold on the car correctly, and it really wouldn't look good long term. You know, if you put down primer first, then you did all the surface work prep, then it worked right. And that's kind of what you're doing with braking oil, is 
you got a little more ZDP because that surface is still fresh. It's clean, it's new, which means there's no anti-wear film on it. So that higher level of ZDP initially for break-in with low detergent allows that primer effect, right? You're getting the anti-wear film established on those parts. Then you're just maintaining it afterwards, you know. Then you can add in with the race oil. The key thing is you're going to add in the molly and the boron. Those are your friction reducers. So that process is part of the, the synergy, right? If you think about what we were doing at Gibbs there in the you know, mid-2000s, you know, with using break-in oil and then race oil, and we were using these, you know, stainless steel, PVD-coated thin rings, the break-in oil and that process of, you know, running an engine load and cycling and all that, all that was designed to do was allow to use that thinner ring, chemically assist the ring to seat in properly. So we would get the least amount of friction, low blow-by, and then once it was established, then we could bring in extra friction reducing agents in the race oil to optimize the total package, right? Again, back to, hey, 46% of the friction is the ring. That still means there's other friction to be had by reducing viscosity, by improving the lubricity of the oil uh, through friction modifiers. So that's where that whole process, you know, there's synergy of working them all together could really unlock the most and the full potential of the engine, which we did in one of us championships doing it. Still proud Super. of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's awesome. All right, here's one for you again. Um, so I understand the benefit of thin rings. A lot of companies are thinning the oil ring as well as second rings. How, you, how are you controlling crankcase pressures and oil control in higher horsepower wet sump street engines? Not LS engines, that's a different issue. Well, you know, oil ring tension does matter, obviously. And then I think one of the, the nice things, if you think about oil control, oil control isn't just coming from the oil ring, you know, the three-piece, uh, you know, oil control ring. The second ring, 80% of this job is oil control. So if you think of the three-piece oil ring as the gross or bulk oil control, the second ring is going to be your fine oil control. So we, t we really like a napier uh, second ring. You know, a ductile napier second ring is a fantastic tool for helping oil control. Back to the engine at Shavers, uh, that was an 11 pound uh, tension, three piece oil control ring, but we were running a ductile Napier second. And in that engine without any vacuum, we had essentially zero oil control problems. You know, once it was broken in, right? right? If you tried to break that in with a, um, high TBN oil, it hated life. But that really was an issue because of the high TBN. When you had the correct break in oil, you can have good oil control, even in a street type engine like that, as long as you have not too low a tension oil ring, but you're also complementing the oil control ring with that ductile napier second and you know, balancing those two, if you utilize those two rings together, you can really achieve good oil control. And that makes a big difference. All right, hope that, here's another hope, one. Hope that answers the question. Okay, all right. So here's one. Um, with, the gas, with the gas ported rings, will they work with a naturally aspirated nitro-fueled air-cooled motor or will the rings lose their properties? Also, maybe you mentioned it, but I missed it. What type of metal is used to produce them? Okay, so when it comes to the gas ported rings, uh, we have got a couple of different options. You know, for your just street high performance guy, a, a really easy upgrade if you're using shelf pistons that are not gas ported 
um, you know, say they're tipping a lot of those shelf pistons are going to be, you know, either a, a 564th or a 16th, um, you know, ring groove uh, design. We have, you know, ductile Molly, you know, cast rings that we can, that we, that we are, that are gas board, they're on the shelf, you know, because of the, the size of that ring, there's so much material there. It's very easy to go in and put in very thin, shallow uh, gas ports in that ring that do not compromise uh, the integrity of that ring to the point where it's a problem to be used in a street type application. And of course, because them being uh, you know, ferrous materials, the detergent in the motor oil is going to do a great job keeping them clean, plus that contacting the ring. So you can use those uh, gas ported ductile molly that the CR set rings on the street without a problem. Now, for the performance engines, like the competition engines, that's where we really recommend going with the stainless steel, you know, the AP steel rings. So that's 440B stainless steel, uh, and those work really, really good uh, up to about 1500 horsepower. Uh, and again, all the benefits of gas boarding, but those benefits last longer, less bore wear, more even bore wear, and you can do that with the 440B stainless. But level beyond that, if you're talking about really high horsepower nitrous stuff, now you're going to get into the M2 tool steel. So obviously we've got M2 tool steel rings. We've been doing, you know, for the Pro Mod guys and stuff like that, and they are fantastic because that material is just a better material. You know, you as that power density increases and that so the severity of the environment you know and you think about you know with um, nitrous versus a, a gasoline application or even a methanol application you know what's unique about nitrous is you know that it's it's a gas you know it but because in because it's contains oxygen and it's in, in a gaseous form like that that vaporizes so easily it's so aggressive in terms of the flame front and it, all the guys who do, do and i'm not an nitrous tuning guy right i just know people who are um and slept at a holiday inn last night right um but you know because nitrous has such a hard impact that's why you want to use the m2 tool steel the tool steel material is able to handle that sudden impact that harsh environment better than stainless steel can. Now, obviously, I mean, you're at lower levels of nitrous and boost and all that, the, you know, uh, stainless steel is going to be better uh, than ductile moly because it's, you know, going to have more elasticity, uh, better tittle strength. But then when you get to the really high, crazy applications, that's where the way to achieve it isn't a thicker ring. It's moving the tool steel and allowing that conformability to be in there because there's all that distortion, the thinner ring, better material is going to give you better conformability, uh, and that's going to give you the better performance overall. Hope that answered that question. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Lake. All right. Um, we've got time. We're going to do one more question here, and then uh, we got, we'll let everybody sort of get on with the day. So this is a good question. Will aluminum anti-seize cause detrimental oil contamination and introduce bearing surface wear? Ooh. It certainly could, you know. Um, any type of solid lubricant, because that's you know, anesthesia is a great example. You know, it's a compound. It's got a lot of different additives in it, or uh, materials in it, and they are solids. Um, those are required, you know, in, in a lot of places in, in the engine to assemble it properly, you know. But you really want to minimize the amount of that that can be, you know, exposed to the oiling system. Yeah, I know uh, several years ago, uh, the guys at ARP asked me to talk to them, you know, about that. You know, how uh, assembly lube is going to be interacting with the motor oil and can it have an, a negative impact Um on the engine and how it performs and the answer is yes it, it, it can so you want to minimize that which is also one of the reasons why it's important to change the oil pretty soon right you you get in there and you, you do your initial break-in you get things going 
get that stuff out of the engine because it, you know some of the stuff in there is going to be good some of the stuff isn't necessarily ideal uh so yeah that's a good question and that's the reason why you want to change the oil more regularly yeah you know, especially early on in the engine's life to get stuff out all right thanks lake we do have several more questions we've got a few here um but what we're going to do again just to respect everybody's time uh, Lake, we're, he's really good at getting back to everybody, so we're going to uh, pass those along to him and uh, just remind everybody that we will see Lake again next week in our super webinar on May 15th. And uh, again, if you're not registered for this one, this is a must see. I mean, to have all four of these gentlemen, worth it. <laughs> exactly, to have Billy and Keith and Lake and uh, and uh, Ben all on, on one venue is phenomenal. So we're looking forward to next week. And uh, again, we're, we'll be talking to everybody next week on that one. Um, I'm going to flip over here just a minute for Amanda, and she's going to tell you about a little bit of contact information to reach us. And Lake did mention today that if anybody's looking to get a copy of his presentation, let us know. Um, again, just put that in the questions box there, and we will get you a copy of that. So, Lake, we always respect your time. We appreciate it. You're a huge help to us, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again next week. Thanks again. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody that tuned in to watch today. Uh, I really, really uh, appreciate it. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Everybody stay safe and have a, a great day.